I believe the last time DOC had any cameras was in 1995-96. So, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great accomplishment at this time even just to have 16 perimeter cameras up, you know, and then hopefully once this RFP comes into play, we'll have three posts that will have cameras. Again, we're looking at federal grants at this time to see what we can do to get additional cameras so that we can hopefully have 100% coverage of the facility. Yes, I would think the interior cameras would be uh, a very important asset to have, especially since your officers are there. Right. Um, and their safety is also a concern. And so the three, the three posts that we originally identified were your high security posts. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the priority this time. We went with the perimeter cameras primarily because there was a lot of contraband being thrown over the fences. So, uh, you know, uh, now that we've had those cameras uh, in the perimeter, uh, hopefully, I mean, initially we were catching quite a few, you know, uh, you saw in the media mm -hmm. where we caught several people trying to bring in uh, contraband. And again, working with the K-9 unit over at Customs and Quarantine, we have a great partnership with them. And so hopefully we're, we've cut down, we're not gonna say we've cut down 100% of, of contraband, but we've tightened up security to the point where uh, we're making arrests and and Was there a request us. for funding in the past to have interior cameras? Maybe, Warden, you can. Were there? No, ma'am, I can't recollect on that one. Okay. So have you um, done perhaps any um, research in the cost of this for the interior cameras? Well, j just, just the three posts alone, it's going, uh, the, the RFP that I signed, the award that I signed uh, was three hundred over $300,000. Okay. Okay, so if, if we are going to have interior cameras in, in all the posts, you know, um, we would we would probably safely say you know another three million four million dollars. Again, you know I, I I can't really say because we don't know. You know every post is different mm -hmm. in as far as camera coverage. Yes. So uh, you know it'd be a guess for me at this point in time three four million dollars. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the inmates. I. Um, I understand that, you know, perhaps some uh, crimes are more severe than others. Uh, do you separate them or do you have uh, some kind of uh, criteria that puts, for example, um, like grand theft, auto grand theft in one housing unit and, you know, those that commit sexual assaults in rapes and, and so forth in another housing unit and murderers in another housing unit? Yeah, we do have classifications of inmates, okay. so we do place them. And I can have the warden address what those various classifications are, warden? Yes, sir. And we have uh, approximately, we have 11 classifications, okay? So we go from on class all the way up to uh, pre-parole. We have uh, on class, max level one, two, three, medium level one, two, three, minimum in, minimum out, and uh, community service and pre-parole. What is unclass, Warden? <clears throat> Say again, ma'am? What is unclass? Unclassified, there are pre-trial detainees. I'm sorry? They're just waiting for a uh, classification, ma'am. They just got, uh, I'm sorry, a sentence and are waiting for a classification. Okay, whether they're going to be classed in the... Uh, classification is based on uh, certain criteria, yes. such as uh, uh, the nature of the crime committed, Yes. And that's where that pretty much answers your question if about segregation from murderers and uh, misdemeanors. So you, ho you, ho you house the unclass all in one same unit? As much as we can, yes, ma'am. Okay. Because of our limited space, we... Okay, so you said there's 11 classifications. Yes. Please bear with me, Kay, because uh, sure, sure. the, e the echo is loud and I... Yes, it is. I have bad... Uh, I've lost my hearing over the years. And then you have... Um, then you classify them in accordance with the nature of their crime. Their crime and their uh, psychological and medical needs. And, and then, so can we go through that? Can you list those for me? Okay, the list? Yes. Once again, okay, you have unclassified. 
Okay. okay. You said there's 11, right? I only yes. heard two. That's why okay. I'm asking the question. Yeah, they, uh, you have uh, unclassified. Okay. And then they go before uh, uh, an adjustment uh, classification committee. So based on their conviction, they look at the uh, proper uh, classification level to place them in. Okay. For, as an example, someone who's been convicted of uh, murder. Okay. Based on that, they'll go to max level one. Max level one. Yes. As the behavior improves, they go through again another review. If granted, based on behavior, again, it's all uh, base-oriented uh, uh, system. Mm -hmm. If they improve, they go up to max level two. Okay. Max level three. Okay. And, the, and this, this level requires two officers to one inmate. Okay. Then after that, uh, they go to medium level one, medium level two medium level three. Uh, these folks are basically in a, in a open housing unit. Going back to the max level, those are like the 23 and ones. Okay. And medium level, how, what, is the, what is the criteria One, for that? One, medium level two, medium level three, those are basically uh, within an open uh, housing. They're, they're able to move around the housing unit. They're allowed to go out and work details within the compound. Right. What is the nature of the crime that puts them in medium level one? Again, they progress. They progress in steps. They can, uh, again, uh, from from murder, if they serve a significant amount of time, and they progress to the max levels, based on okay. years. I understand. Yeah, then they get promoted to medium level I one. Can I get a copy of a breakdown? Sure. Now, you mentioned earlier about your um, SOPs, and, and there were two items that I caught, and they were about your, uh, your personnel, primarily your personnel and your special, your, uh, like a quick response team. What is the protocol uh, or the, pra the pr procedure in place when you, at the times that you release inmates for I guess recreation time is if that's what you call it. Yes. And um, you know what are the steps that the officers must take uh, when upon opening the cell, um, you know, allowing them to move down the hall out into the recreational area, closing the cell, um, allowing certain inmates in and out uh, to maintain also the capacity for what the officers can handle. Um, you know, within the recreation time or even during um, meal, meal time. Can you just walk me through that operation? Just pretend I know nothing and you're trying to paint yes. me a picture. Okay, uh, once again, on the max housing uh, unit, it's basically they just eat within uh, okay. their, their uh, rooms, they conduct fresh air outside in a controlled environment, a yard, okay. and it's supervised. When you go to the medium classification level, Again, these are, it's, uh, the movement is less restrictive. However, when they do come out of the housing unit, mm -hmm. they are properly supervised, whether it be outside and, or inside the housing unit. They're, they're under some form of supervision. Uh, to include males, when they're coming down for males, they're escorted down. A uh, special operations team also take part in that and, and make sure that there is also coverage on that escorting. So, okay, so, um I'd like to go a little bit deeper and then okay. just to generalize. So for example, let's say it's recreation time. If I'm an officer and I, and I know that whatever time we have recreation, what is the first thing I do? Okay, first of all, I also announce recreation time. Okay. Okay. And then gets all the uh, inmates that are going to participate in recreation and account for all these inmates before they even check out of the housing unit. Okay. Now that officer will assure that there is an escort awaiting for these inmates to check out of his housing unit. So you you handpick which inmates go out for recreation. No, actually, it's on a, in a uh, in the medium housing level. Okay. We announce it. It's not handpicked. So it's, it's available to whoever wants to participate okay. in recreation. Anyone. It's their time out. Yes. Okay. Then before they even roll out, they contact our, our central control unit. Okay. Basically, uh, alerting central control unit that we are now going to. It uh, place our recreation, this union to recreation mode now. Okay. Checking out so many inmates out to recreation. Okay. And during all that time, there's uh, supervision. 
So and once, it's, that's it's, com once it's completed, that also the recreation officer will call up Central. Uh, completed recreation, I have so many inmates still under my uh, supervision, we're going back to the housing unit. Okay. The receiving unit will check them off as they walk as in, they walk in? Okay. and check them as they come in as well. Okay. And the Patting cell down them, pat them down. So. Oh, very good. And the cells are locked, right? This yes, when they leave their housing unit. Sorry, okay, and secure. then when they enter, do you ensure that you lock it again? Yes. And this is all done manually? Yes. Okay. D is there at any time where you just have one inmate out for recreation or two or does i mean you know just generalize no it's 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 rare that we're going to have something like that because uh, that's their time out of the housing unit they're going to take full advantage of that and they it's their are time to stretch their legs and, and okay and they are there. always supervised yes all the time yes um. and by the way we do have that added perimeter cameras that uh, also can they're focused on the recreation yes, area as well. also. Okay. So I understand we're moving forward with the electronic locking system. Yes. And that's for every every door, every even the even which the staff enters, the officers enter, and also with the inmates, or is it just for inmate cells that they are currently in? Okay. Senator uh, in re in regards to the consent decree. Uh, the judge identified three posts. Again, these were the six, so seven, and seventeen. Okay. So six, seven, seventeen. The the uh, the award that I just signed are going to cover those three posts. Now, uh, there we did install on our own uh, locking mechanisms. And uh, which posts were those? Yeah, post five, six, post seven, and post seventeen. Right. So there's still a few more posts that. Um, need changing. We we are in the process now of changing 50 locks at the Gatnia facility. Okay. Uh, and I believe there it's halfway completed. The uh, vendor uh, ran out of locks, so he's waiting for the the additional locks to come in. Can you? Because uh, I'm sure uh, I don't know to call you senator or <laughs> director, but I'm sure that's when you come into the agency. You you you've gone through every. Um, a risk factor there, right? And I'm sure that there's a plan in place to eventually put electronic systems perhaps in almost, you know, just about every area that the inmates go through and the staff goes through for security. So it, can you provide me a list of, of those items? Sure. Yeah. And we can provide you a list of already what has electronic yes, locks, please. what uh, is in the process. Of course, the plan is, is like I said, uh, you know, to put cameras throughout the entire facility. Yes. Again, uh, we're, we're looking for the necessary funding to do that. Yes. Um, I mean, we're, we're taking the necessary steps yes. in the last few months to, to try to do what we can. I mean, and can know, I also get a list of that also sure. for your, the interior cameras? I mean, you know, let to, you know, whatever you feel. Sure. I'm sure you know that there should be cameras Oh yeah, I agree. <laughs> organization, you know, that the whole security area. Yeah, yeah especially. I, I mean, I agree with you, Senator, and that's that's why, you know, we're, we're <clears throat> at this point in time we're taking. I mean, you know, <clears throat> based on availability of funds and and, and the federal funding that we have available to us, mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to, to make the most of of that funding. So, yes. uh, I, I think it, it was a great accomplishment, uh, just even having now perimeter cameras. We we have the eye in the sky which we can do a 360 now of the entire complex. Right. So, um, you know, as time goes by, we, we look to make more improvements as, as, as we go on. Okay. Um, and how about your smoke alarm system? Is that in place? Uh, you, know, <clears throat> um, you know, as you know, the media covered that the fire department came by. So we actually met with a, uh, <clears throat> a vendor, and so we, uh, to do a, a an overview, and so we, I will be putting out a, an emergency procurement to uh, bring us up to speed. Uh, hopefully, we can get that uh, done uh, rather quickly. Uh, again, depending upon the procurement process and on how long that takes, but it's in the works, and and uh, I've, I've put it on uh, my priority list and, and labeling it as an emergency procurement. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions I have for now. If you can just get me the sure. um, 
the cost analysis for your overtime matrix that you're okay. currently working sure. on, and the the cameras that you need, the locking mechanisms that you need. I know that you're only getting it in selected areas, so if we can look at you know areas of other sure. need as well and put that in there, uh, this is in preparation for budget, right? Sure. And then. Um, Yes, and I would like to meet with you again sure. uh, after I see everything and, and really, you know, go a little bit deeper because right now we're just touching the surface. Um, I'm also concerned with the incidents that's been happening at the Agania lockup and at, at the um, main facility, uh, most especially with one of our, our inmates that is now in critical condition. So when that investigation is complete, I'd like for us to have an oversight hearing so that we can uh, identify whatever the investigation said that had happened and what we can do to move forward in ensuring the protection of, of the officers and also of the uh, detainees. Um, I'd like to congratulate you on the consent decree. Uh, uh, you know, that's, I know that was a, a, a tough battle, but great job on that and thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And I know that your job is not easy. It's, it's very challenging to, to do what you do, and, so, and many times it's life-threatening also for the officers. So I want to thank you know, your team and all the officers for their hard work, for their dedication, and I really would like to see what we can do to help give them, uh, to help provide more personnel for your overtime, because this, this job is a very straining job. It impacts their health also, yeah. and we want to take care of our officers that are at the service of the public. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so thank you for your time. And in 30 days, I'd like to meet with you again. Sure. And perhaps the investigation regarding uh, Mr. Menno would be done. And then we can also just include it with an oversight. Sen Senator, just real quickly, you know, I mean, I, I know that most of your questions revolve primarily around the security side of the house. Sure. But, you know, we are a correctional facility. And, and you know, we're also working to make great strides in, in to cut down recidivism. Yes. Uh, and programs that, that we are currently working on uh, are also equally as important as security because the reality is is if when we cut down recidivism, we'll have less individuals coming back. And really that's our, our goal as a correctional facility. So uh, maybe next time at the hearing, uh, we'll also be able to discuss programs uh, Well, maybe we can do it now. Do you, do you have time? We can do it now. Sure. I haven't called it to order yeah, yet. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, okay. I, I mean, to me, that's equally important. But, sure. you know, I'd like, I, if let's, anything, let's talk a little bit about because, uh, so yeah, one of, the, one of the things that, uh, and I know I'm, open, you know, other directors will say, you know, be glad you're done. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I just think that, that uh, you know, we're making great strides. Um, okay. In, in regards to casework, maybe we can call Therese Tayama. Uh, but, um, you know, one of, one of the main things that we're working on right now, and the legislature allowed us to do it uh, through, through the hard work of uh, Senator uh, Respicio, was to allow us to actually uh, create a nonprofit organization within DOC to run the prison industry. The prison industry is going to be uh, one of the, the main drivers as, as we begin the process. Um, to rehabilitate individuals because what we're looking at now is training these individuals with certified skills. We're working very closely with the Department of Labor and the underserved communities and likewise with uh, Bert Johnston over the Guam Trades Academy uh, to see and identify what training programs we can make available. Currently we have a cycle ongoing with the Guam Trades Academy uh, and, and I believe we have 10, 10 participants, right? 10 participants going through those courses. But, but the intent is, is to, to, as these individuals leave DOC, and you know, our plan is we want them to leave with a certificate certifying them in a skill. So that, I mean, it's hard enough leaving DOC uh, with that record behind you and trying to secure a job now for your family. A lot of these individuals go back to the life of crime because they have no other alternative. So, you know, it's also our responsibility as a correctional facility to make sure that we provide them the necessary tools to, 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 to succeed outside the, the gate of DOC. Um, you know, again, like I said, currently we're working with the Trades Academy. And we're, we're just in, in the final stages of a developing a MOU with the Department of Public Works 
to teach uh, our uh, clients uh, how to operate a backhoe in exchange will they'll get certification but they'll also what DPW will gain is these these individuals will now work with DPW to clear the ponding basins around the island uh, we're working with Guam Housing Corporation on a similar project to help re help them rehabilitate some of their their low-income homes uh, by teaching our inmates how to, to uh, you know construction and finishing work and that kind of thing so you know these are the things that we're working with an NGO just recently approached this uh, and they're building uh, they're similar to that of habitat of humanity and if we can identify 20 inmates to train under uh, skilled labor mm -hmm. on, on doing construction work so the, you know to us this is is uh, a really important uh, uh, really important goal for us and, and then on top of that casework also handles uh, rehabilitation programs we have the matrix we have uh, we also have uh, RSAD we have uh, I have reconation I always mispronounce that reconation I got that right <laughs> Oral recognition. So, what is it? What is it? Oral recognition, which is primarily, you know, it's it's a moral thing, telling them what's right, what's wrong, you know, that type of thing. So we have all these programs, uh, so that the, eventually, as as we develop this, you know, we, we can cut down recidivism. So I'm going to turn it over to Teresa, because uh, you know she should have equal time in regards to, you know, what she's done and what she want, you know, hopes to accomplish. Good morning. Good morning. So to add on to what the director was stating with regard to programs, we, as part of our mission, we really want to help, as he said, our inmates to return and be successful when they come back into the community. And he was talking about the various partnerships that we have um, with our other fellow government entities, such as the Guam Judiciary with the ORASC Risk Assessment Survey. That is one thing that we're moving toward, to have more measurable, um, observable uh, levels of risk and in order to help our inmates um, place them in appropriate treatment programs. We have the adult education program with GCC, which has been one of our more stable and longer standing programs. We currently have uh, 10 inmates who had tested out and with various uh, challenges that we have, we're hoping to um, work through those so that eventually they may obtain their GED adult education diploma. We also have the father, mother, father read, which is basically an interactive uh, program through CAHA that helps our inmates to improve their reading skills and they can learn parenting interaction through reading. We have, um, we are most recently going to be starting a creative inside Joey art program also through CAHA which is going to be going for an eight week period that would be focusing on our female uh, inmates. We also hope at the end of this program to have a, an exhibit showcasing their artwork. There's also the Healthy Families, Healthy Relationships program in partnership with Westcare that is going into its second week. We have eight inmates identified in that where we allow it as an incentive their significant others to participate in those structured counseling sessions. And and the, for this, uh, the West Care program, the Healthy Families, um, does this, does this uh, is it a volunteer? It doesn't matter if you're maximum security or? That's correct. We okay. basically um, focused you're, on our medium level oh, medium population. Level. Sure. And as he said, the DOC Trades Academy, last year in partnership with Department of Labor and Mr. Bert Johnston, we had several of our inmates trained. It's kind of like the train the trainers. Mm -hmm. So we recently started our first cycle of inmate instructors teaching other inmates on basic construction skills. And then we have, um, we're still in, in, in progress is the, the uh, Corrections Public Works Program that's uh, designed to help our inmates develop or enhance, continue on with their backhoe skills, mm -hmm. cleaning out our ponding basins. There, we still have the praise and worship services. That's one of the other longstanding programs we've had along with the G GCC adult education. There's also RSAT, then our halfway house. We're hoping 
I, uh, we're still looking to identify some homes around the island where hopefully those who are ready for release can uh, integrate back into the community and get re-familiarize themselves with life, uh, life skills and um, their folk rehab skills and employment. Then we have the um, director is working with the UOG Ag Extension Program as well as BOS BSP Coastal Management to study or to do a study with regard to um, opportunities we may have at our facility for agricultural farming and possibly aquaculture. So those are some of the programs we have in addition to, as he stated, the moral recognition therapy um, intervention. We also have um, thinking for a change, the matrix model and sex offender treatment program. And those are all uh, part of the, the bigger picture of justice reform where we are now looking more at cognitive behavioral therapeutic programs where we don't really delve into the past but more into the here and now hoping to shape and change the way um, we make decisions so we hope to help our inmates with that well that's a very impressive uh, list that you have and that you've developed so um, and yes thank you very much because really if you just lock them up and you know, let them go out for recreation and then go back in and have meals. I mean, there's really uh, no sense of uh, empowerment or mind change. So that's that's very good. And for the GCC Trades Academy, um, have you had any graduates from that? Other than how many trainers do you have within the? We currently have ten. Population. I can't remember okay. the actual number. Was it eight that we had? Yeah, eight, eight instructors eight. that we trained. Six. Of the eight graduated and we currently have 10 now so it's kind of our first generation so everything is kind of uh, uh, we we're excited about all the, the uh, new things that we have going and we remain committed and steadfast along with security to well, re reach our mission well director that's your uh, shining light <laughs> We don't, we don't look ourselves as just a prison. You know, yeah. We, we want to make sure that we, we complement each other. And I mean, uh, you know, when I first took this position, I used to be the general manager of the Visitors Bureau many years ago. And I, I run into my old hotel friends, and they say, what are you doing now? And I go, I run a hotel. And we have 130% occupancy rate, right? And, and then I tell them I'm a DOC. And, and really, it's a city that we run. You know, we feed them, we house them, we clothe them, uh, and we take care of their medical needs, their dental, their psychological needs. So, uh, you know, we're, we're all encompassing. I mean, and so, and that's what we have to look at DOC as, uh, not just as a as security. Of course, security is probably the most important, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that we take care of the individuals, not holistically and not just on the right. security side. But again, Senator, thank you very much for having us. Yes, yes. Well, it's very good. I'd like to commend you, Mr. Yama, on the hard work that you're doing. I think you just made him look a, a thousand times better for, what he's <laughs> <laughs> for the role. But uh, no, thank you very much. I really appreciate that, that you are really trying to change their mindset and empower them and give them that hope that they need. Uh, perhaps even uh, growing up, they didn't have someone that really believed in them in that sense. And you truly have to have a heart to want to do these things and to help them. So thank you and thank you also uh, Dr. Timinglow for uh, you know being there for the for the staff and the inmates as well and thank all of you. I do have one more question. Sure. Uh, the post is coming up in December and I'm, I'm asking all of the public safety agencies you know this question. Um, if they've worked with the post commission to discuss the um, the impacts and the requirements should their public safety officers not able to meet the standard or the physical fitness test. Um, a uh, couple days earlier I met with GFD and so some of the concerns that I had is if, if they can't perform their job what is offered to them because essentially they would have to move to another job or perhaps another organization right. and so I want to you know make sure or see what you have done to to help the officers prepare for the post because uh, and also work with the post commission. So. 
I, you know, in, in regards to the, the PT side, I mean, I know that's, that's been a, a major hurdle for not just us, but all the, the uh, public safety agencies. Uh, you know, you have a lot of the older officers who've been in the system uh, for many years uh, who will have difficulty possibly in attaining, you know, the fiscal side of the house. But the reality is, is uh, those senior officers uh, bring a wealth of knowledge and institutional knowledge uh, to the agency and, and uh, you know, losing individuals as a result of a law for that purpose uh, could hinder operations, uh, you know, of the various public safety agencies. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to the warden, but I know that I think we're above 60% passing so far, right, with our guys, uh, warden? Oh, okay, very good. Well, Senator, with the, uh, with the... Because uh, some of them are concerned also, right? Yes, well... They're doing a test run on a new uh, requirement, right? right. right? The, instead of the mile and a half, it's, it's a, a mile, one, one mile. mile. Yes. So with that, uh, with that, uh, we are almost like 60% passing. Okay. okay. However, if they do implement, I mean, if they do go up forth with the, the law, the one and a half, I think we're gonna. Yeah, I think all the agencies. All across the board. And we have also removed the tape. Yes, they also. We've removed, removed the yes. tape. And so, Thank goodness. you know, so, so I met with the post commission last week and I discussed the change and um, they have about 30 days and we'll meet right. again to discuss that change and to implement it uh, either by uh, a bill uh, to really uh, secure the success rate of the officers right. and all that perform public safety. Uh, have you considered also the, um, the health elements that they have? For example, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and so forth. You know, um, the impacts of that. I know they're supposed to see a doctor. Yes, um, ma'am. They actually have to submit a uh, medical uh, screening form before they even participate in the event. Right. And what if they're unable to participate in the, the event? The uh, criteria is that they uh, they get reviewed by uh, our uh, medical staff, basically. What do you mean by review? Meaning. If they don't, if they don't participate, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's there's four. Uh, uh, every quarter it's going to be testing. Okay. When it be, when it becomes uh, yes. when it becomes when it, when it uh, starts in December, every failure is going to be a uh, administrative write up. Now, if they can't participate because of medical reasons, mm -hmm. again they'll be reviewed by the uh, post commission to see if they're fit for duty. And if they're not fit for duty. Then again, it's it's up to our agency head and the commission to determine what right. either reassign or reassign or. Not so uh, yes, I want to make sure that there's a plan in place, not just uh, us talking yeah, about we, it. We, yes. we, you know, we, we follow the, pro, the the law, the post yes. law. Uh, so, of course, it's you know, it's going to impact every every public safety agency on the island. Yes. So, um, it, and that, that's the reason we've been meeting. We've made some adjustments to the current law which uh, the, the law allows the post commission to do. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, hopefully, I mean, I know all the agencies are working diligently, uh, but- right, but I'm concerned about your agency. Well, <laughs> and I, well you know, we, we, have, we have the same issues that every other agency right. has here as well. So, you know, we work with the commission and we, and we will right. we'll see what we can do. Yes, and, um, and that's what I'm getting at, is that there's a concrete plan in place that if they cannot perform their job, what are the options available to the officers? And I want to make sure that you inform the officers of this, because, you know, uh, if you if you don't uh, give them that time frame that they need to prepare themselves for what may be the inevitable because of their health ailments, you know, what can we do to help them? Because if they move out, essentially, if a, you know, some of them might not receive the same pay. So we right. still need to look That's at right. the agencies that they'll transfer into. Perhaps, you know, you need to explore the options and have something in writing informing them of this. And, and all the officers, Senator, are aware of, of the post that they need to pass. If they don't pass, the, this, these are the circumstances uh, that could result. So, you know, I mean, the law actually has given sufficient time right. to everyone to, to comply. Uh, We're in our second year. Even in, 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 in December, when it comes into play, uh, if you fail, you still there's still time yes, to come into compliance. Yes. So, 
One full year. Yes. You have a full year to comply. And every 90 yeah. days they'll get yeah. tested. And so everyone in the law enforcement uh, community has been um, advised of this. It actually became law two years ago right. to start preparing for this for this right. day. So it's been two years and you only have 60% yeah. that are able to pass, right? Yeah. So let's prepare for and something. And hopefully by December we'll get a, a larger amount of... And, uh, you know, especially... I would like that. Yes. I would like that. I think, Senator, you know, with the three and a half on, three and a half off now, it also gives the officers time now to to get in shape. When they were working five, 12 hour shifts and then being called in to RD, on their RDO to work overtime, uh, didn't give them sufficient time to, you know, work out and exercise and that type of thing. So hopefully with the schedule ongoing now, those three and a half days off, they can prepare themselves for, for the so, fiscal So, you know, I'm, I, I've been calling a lot of informational briefings because I want to be more of a proactive uh, senator than a reactive. Yeah. So I'm, I'm asking the agencies and I'm asking you to ensure that there's a plan in place to help these officers if they're not able to meet the requirements due to health needs. And I'd like to address that plan that you, you sure. will have created and, um, and see where we can yeah. go for that. I, I think, I think. Uh, I mean, it's fine, we can just go by the law, but the law does yeah. not state specifics, right? Yeah. So I'd like to see specifics to address the needs of your agency. And I, I, think, I think in regards to plans, I mean, I'm speaking now on the civil service side of the house. I was civil service director for several years. Uh, and, and it was one of the things I even brought up during the post commission meetings is that we need to come up with a unified plan because right. if, if every agency has their own plan, uh, is it now compliant, right? If it, one plan is different from another agency, does that in classified employee now have the capacity to file a grievance with the civil service commission because standards are not the same throughout the public safety agencies. So these are one of the things I know I, I brought up during one of the post meetings is that we need to come up with a standardized that all of us follow. That's right. So that, you know, we could be different from the other agency and they, oh, how come they did it and we didn't do it? And, and so it opens the doors for the various agencies then to, to for their employees to file grievances. So. Right. You know, uh, you might want to call Senator, I mean Senator, uh, Dennis Santa Tomas and, and maybe yes, you I, can I met and, with and, him last week and maybe come to one of our post meetings and, yes. and then, you know, participate. I, I've met with them and I, and I, saw, I spoke yeah. with them about my concerns. So thank you for that recommendation, <laughs> duly noted. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Department of Corrections, Deputy Director uh, Kate Baltazar, Ms. Tayama, Mr. Limo, Dr. Simon Glow. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Joran Rivera, Miss Lazama, I, I didn't get I didn't get your your yeah. Miss Nauta, Colonel, thank you very much, and and Captain, thank you for coming, uh, thank you for your service and all your work. It is now 10:27, and this uh, committee on housing, utilities, public safety, and homeland security is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>